STV, votre télé. Zone STV coming up. A regional council is expected in Mezam to talk about issues faced by Anglophones in the Northwest region. An announcement of Prime Minister Philemon Yang as he ended his sensitization tour this Friday. Cameroon receives two military aircrafts with remarkable capacities to fight Boko Haram in the Far North region. Gifts worth 24 billion CFA francs are from the United States of America. Those were top stories. Thanks for joining us in today's newscast. The Northwest Regional Coordinator of the CPDM political party has told militants in Mezam that a regional council would be created. Prime Minister Philemon Yang disclosed this at the end of his sensitization and mobilization tour of the seven divisions. Lovetbe reports. CPDM militants in Mezam division have been called up to actively to ensure peace returns back to the Northwest region. The call was made by Prime Minister Philip Munyang as he met with the CBDM militants of Mezam Division during his sensitization and mobilization tour of the seven divisions of the Northwest region about the head of state's decision to dialogue, which he says is ongoing. According to Prime Minister Philip Munyang, three major reasons brought him to the Northwest region. Firstly, to continue with the head of state's dialogue process. Secondly, to call on CBDM militants to stand up against those who are threatening Cameroon peace and lastly to ask CBDM militants to actively mobilize and participate in the upcoming 46th edition of the National Day celebrations in Cameroon. During the meeting, the floor was open to anyone who had any worries to address or any observations to make. Some CBDM militants raised concerns like the brutality of the military, boarding schools that have already closed, including students of examination classes and threats from unknown individuals. Others requested for the head of state to address the Anglophones because him staying quiet makes them feel abandoned. The PM in response has promised to take back the message to the head of state and has concerns the brutality of the military. Administrative authorities in the region would follow up their actions in the field with collaborations from the population. The PM equally regretted the fact that most CPDM militants were not putting on their party uniforms because of fear. According to the PM, those CPDM militants have been targeted by the secessionist group. They still have the responsibility to end this crisis and this cannot be done effectively if the population continues to encourage school boycotts, ghost towns, and also if they continue to be frightened by the threats. As part of measures to end the crisis, the PM has told the militants that a regional council would be created in the northwest region that would be led by individuals from the region and will speak for the region. The Cameroon National Salvation Front has joined forces with the National Alliance for Democracy and Progress ahead of future political battles in Pitowa, north region of the country. This was during a political rally in the town that was aimed at revitalizing the basic organs of the party. Peter Sossi. A political rally to thank the head of state for his achievements in the Grand North and revitalize the basic organs of the Cameroon National Salvation Front. Isa Chiroma Bakari, national president on a crowd pulling offensive in Pitwa, north region of Cameroon. This meeting has already taken place, few turn out, but many of our militants and sympathizers, all of them, are surrounding us. They want to know what next, what to do in order to exercise power, what to do in order to be at the helm of the, 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 the nation, what to do in order to sensitize. Coming on the heels of the political capture of the mayor of Pitwa, Yerima Dewa, a former staunch militant of the National Union for Democracy and Progress, NUDP. The Cameroon National Salvation Front sees this as a major milestone in the town. But even more remarkable is the extension of a mark of solidarity to the National Alliance for Democracy and Progress, ANDP, whose leader, Amadou Mustafa Adewali, evoked nostalgic moments with the national president of the Cameroon National Salvation Front when both men served the NUDP in the 90s. In this 
part of our nation, we have many political parties. Cameroon National Salvation Front, ANDP, UNDP, and many other political parties being chartered, being divided. We stand no chance to meet our target, to meet our goal. The reason why he strongly championed the idea of coming together, of merging together, in order to have a very strong and trustworthy and inspiring political party. For the Cameroon National Salvation Front, Paul Bia remains the choice of the nation, but party faithfuls must play their role. To be a good citizen means that you, are capable, you have the capacity and possibility to cast your ballot in order to decide as a who is going to preside over the destiny of our nation. So, subscription. You have to be registered. You have to record with elegant in order to have the possibility to cast a ballot, no matter which election is to come first. The National Union for Democracy and Progress also had a rally in Pitwa a week ago, and it is evident the town remains a key flashpoint docked between rival parties, a situation which could see fireworks in upcoming council and parliamentary elections. On to one of our lead stories, the U.S. government has donated high-tech aircraft to Cameroon to fight Boko Haram. These aircraft, specialized in intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance missions, were handed over to the minister delegate at the presidency in charge of defense, Joseph Betiasomo, in Yaoundé today by the U.S. ambassador to Cameroon. The C-208 Cessna program is valuated at approximately 24 billion CFA francs and would reinforce the fight against against Boko Haram with its remarkable capacities in built cameras that could capture images from the ground some 10 kilometers away, provide information through video and photographs as well as radio communication. Pilots, equipment operators and maintenance personnel shall all be trained so that they can have a grip on these machines. Back here in Douala, a new firefighting unit will soon see the light of day. Few months from now, inhabitants of Yasa and its environs would witness the timely intervention of rescuers. Dr. Fritz Ntonentone gave the assurance as he visited the Yasa construction site today. John Bosama tells us more. In a bid to ensure that fire outbreaks in the city of Douala, which is becoming habitual, be curbed, the Douala City Council is constructing a base for the firefighters in Yasa, Douala 3 subdivision to ensure that it adds to the two existing ones and make each subdivision boost of a firefighting unit for quick interventions. The government delegates to the Douala City Council, Dr. Fritz Tonentone, paid a walking visit to the site which is hosting the structure. L'intérieur de la descente, c'est de venir faire la visite du chantier de, de nouvelles cases. We are here to visit this firefighting unit for the city under construction. This, once completed, will bring the number to three after those in Godi and Bonaberry. And Douala 5 will be the next subdivision to have a firefighting unit. Bonaberry. Measures are geared towards protecting the population. Once completed in about six months, this site will host the recompactment, an initiative that the beneficiaries welcome. Because it's the premier delegate of the government who this will go a long way to ameliorate the quality of services we produce because we are there to serve the population. Donc concrètement, si vous voyez tout ce qui se développe, demain ils auront besoin de la sécurité et de la protection des sapeurs-pompiers. This project is divided into two phases, with the first costing over 475 million francs CFA and the second to cost less as the government delegate highlighted during his visit. 
The International Monetary Fund has released a set of guidelines to tackling corruption in member countries. The reforms to begin in July this year come as Cameroon is presently cleaning its economic sphere to curb malpractices. Peter Sosia reports. The International Monetary Fund says it will systematically address corruption and its impact on economic growth with member countries under new guidelines. The new policy also tackles how rich countries contribute to corruption in the developing world by failing to prevent bribery and money laundering. IMF's Managing Director Christine Lagarde reveals that the framework aims for a more systematic, even-handed, effective and candid engagement with member states. By this, they will be held on the same standards. The guidelines approved last month compels the institution to discuss good governance concerns in all annual economic review of member countries. The new policy comes as Cameroon, which is presently under the IMF Extended Credit Facility Program, sealed in July 2017, has been affecting the arrest and trial of some regime barons for corruption, embezzlement and mismanagement of state funds. A headcount of civil servants is underway to weed out ghost workers from the state's payroll. Though this is not directly linked to the IMF reforms, it has however been saluted by a recent team from the IMF and the World Bank that completed the second review of the loan agreement with the government. The IMF has insisted it will not investigate specific instances of corruption, rather it will focus on the strength of key economic variables like fiscal and central bank governance, market regulations, the rule of law and policies on money laundering as well as countering terrorism financing. The policy is not expected to lead to more stringent conditions on loans. We move to the southwest region of Cameroon, where Kwa Mokampo, DO for Boya, has asked traditional rulers, leaders of trade unions and social groups in the town to participate in upcoming 20th May celebrations. This was at a security meeting. Clarice Ekora reports. This meeting with traditional rulers, leaders of associations and trade unions in Boya, in preparations of the National Day celebrations on the 20th of May was presided at by the Divisional Officer for Boya Subdivision, Kwam Wokampo, who during the meeting educated the population on security measures that have been put in place to ensure a history 20th May celebrations. Also, the security meeting was a platform for the Divisional Officer of Boya to stress on the need for collaboration between traditional rulers, leaders of trade unions and social groups who were also charged with the responsibility to mobilize the population and their members for a massive turnout. According to the Divisional Officer, such collaboration is very essential, especially as the context in which this year's celebration will take place is that of insecurity. Boya, being the capital of the southwest region, should project a positive example, he added. On their part, traditional rulers have promised to put in their best, as Chief J. Mandenge of Wonja village outlined the readiness of his community to participate in the activities of this day. We are being called upon to mobilize our populations, and I think we are committed to that cause. As Cameroonians, you know, we are Cameroonians, and this, we are in, in Boya subdivision, being the seat of the regional capital of the southwest region. The outgoing commander of the 21st Motorized Infantry Brigade, General Donatien Milingi, encouraged the population to draw closer to security forces who are there to protect them and to denounce any suspected individual in their communities. People of Boya have expressed mixed feelings following a communique issued by the DO for the town prohibiting movement of motorbikes and persons from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. Clarice Kowe once again. According to the Divisional Officer for Boya Subdivision, Kowan Wokan Paul, the Monday 7 communique prohibiting the circulation and movement of motorbikes, public cars and persons from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. daily comes to re-implement the decision of the Southwest Governor put in place for some time now is in a bid to ensure the security of the population, especially as the National Day celebrations draws closer. The curiousness of the trip that we are you know, having this time around and the uh, approach of the 20th May, it had been clearly instructed that no motorbike 
you know, within this 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 uh, period, and especially those plying the main boulevard, uh, they should be stopped. It is not only in the direction of the uh, of the commercial motorcycle riders, but also to the general. A message received with mixed feelings by many. They might be happy to receive such community because we go along with security. But on the other hand, some of us who are into business. We are not all receiving that much enthusiasm because it goes along with stopping our business. I think it's a decision because they are not doing this because they like to do it, it's to preserve our own lives. Although the communique is so far being respected by many, on their part, this going to late night business operators couldn't hide their plight. Business most of the time, I mean, around 6, 7 o'clock like that. But when they ask us to love the shop at 7 o'clock, at times, maybe we usually have something like 50,000 francs a day, but now it has gone drastically down. With strong emphasis of the communique applying to motorbike riders in the main street and even late at night, the population of Boya and even public transport cars have been, however, called to respect the terms of this communique as it is for their security. In brief, students of the universities of Ngaoundere and Mara have started receiving the Paul Bia Higher Education Vision laptops today. Higher Education boss Professor Jacques Famundongo, who began the sharing exercise, called on students to use these machines appropriately, for it is a means to connect with the global world. Environmental and health experts advance dirt littered in the streets is dangerous to all those who linger around. Effective management of waste, the sea could avoid any health hazard. John Bosama. Through the hustle and puzzle that characterizes the city of Douala is embedded one of the town's worst nightmares, waste management. A drive through the economic capital leaves much to be desired, especially along roadsides which are littered with garbage cans filled to the brim, begging for attention to be given it. A phenomenon which is dangerous to the environment. Ce qui est plus dangereux, c'est que vous retrouvez dans ces ordures qu'on ne rappelle plus, hein, parce que ça a évolué. On parle aujourd'hui de déchets domestiques. What is really dangerous about this issue is the fact that domestic waste like pills, batteries, as well as other chemical products are found in them, which poses a serious problem to the ecologic system of Douala and makes the city smelly. He also explains that this has to be managed thoroughly, even though it is expensive to do so. As usual, Faced with earning a living, people have turned to open up business sports in these areas, selling all sorts of food items which most consume regardless of the health risk involved. I only eat this because I have no choice and the stomach needs something. A practice which health experts advise against. Where there are dirt, microbacteria follows, as well as the rate of infection, which is very high in Douala presently, that affects mostly children. Secondly, there are also some skin infections which come along. Thirdly, it also comes with respiratory diseases dangerous to asthma patients. Furthermore, dirt equally causes diarrhea which so many persons come in on a daily basis for treatment. In the midst of all the insalubrity, they however urge locals to do their bit in keeping their environment clean so as to curb the environmental as well as health hazards that these waste products come with. Do you have the habit of biting your nails? If yes, you run the risk of completely damaging the nails and the skin around. You are equally exposed to infections which could harm your digestive system. More in this report. Nail biting, an oral compulsive habit, 
often described as a parafunctional activity, is the act of eating nails. This body-focused repetitive behavior affects about 30% of children between 7 to 10 years and 45% of teenagers around the world. Continuous eating of fingernails leads to deleterious effects in fingers. Now, when you bite them, uh, you are putting saliva on those fingertips and sometimes we are not aware that saliva or, or that we have uh, the number of germs that we have in our mouth is amazing. So biting your nails exposes your nails constantly to these germs uh, and eventually uh, what can happen is there is an infection which can lead to cracking of the nails, you have fungal infection that get into the nails and these are infections which sometimes can take a very long time to treat. Apart from having reddish nails, the anterior teeth could shift out of their proper position. In rare cases, fingernails could be severely deformed due to destruction of the nail bed. Once gotten to this stage, treatment is difficult. It take a very long time to treat because uh, few antibiotics or few antifungals really uh, diffuse uh, easily into the nail. Uh, and most of the time, it, it takes a long time because you have to take the medication while the nail is growing. It is a nail, part of the nail which has been impregnated with, uh, with, with the antibiotic uh, that is resistant to the infection. So it's not something you can treat overnight. Medics advise series of therapies to overcome this clinical pathology. The nail eating, the nail eating habit, uh, like I said, is a habit that needs to be unlearned, just like any other habit. You know, so um, there is a process of unlearning, uh, which starts with awareness, which starts with support, which starts with professional help. Uh, to get the person to understand that it's a habit that has to be stopped. Why those indulged into the practice are struggling to overcome the disorder, keeping one's nails clean and safe should be done with the use of a clean bleed. Let's talk about women and beauty tonight. Hairstyles have no longer become a thing for the young ones, but also for the old. In markets here in Douala, women of all age groups visit to not only purchase synthetic or human hair, but also to look beautiful. It is common to spot a lady passing by due to the color of her hair. engulfs the hair as well. Be it synthetic or human, everyone is served. Women, both young and old, all try to be up to date. Colors are chosen depending on one another's skin complexion. Rihanna cut, Afro cut, braids, curled or straight hair, looking good, is the ultimate goal. Markets have been flooded with these fashion accessories highly demanded by the feminine genre. <laughs> Designing the hair depends on the style requested by each client. Appropriate, so it's not affecting. Because when she wants to remove it, she will wash the hair and remove the gum. So it will not affect her hair. Some use thread and others use gum. Be it gold, blue, red, multicolored or black, what matters is that we don't go unnoticed. 
Let's get news out of Cameroon with VOA. Refugees run over 2,000 small businesses in the Kakuma camp in northwest Kenya, supplying everything from Wi-Fi to canned food. Many pay some taxes, despite receiving no services from the country, and most incomes in the camp depend on aid. I came with nothing, so I started my business here in the refugee camp from scratch. I started looking for employment, working for people, and here I am. The World Bank Group's International Financial Corporation says Kakuma is a vibrant, informal economy and is urging private investors to take advantage of the opportunities. Yes, the private sector is there to, to make some money. The private sector in return brings job opportunities for host population and refugees, um, better delivery of services, more sustainable one in our opinion. That's the IFC experience so far over 60 years but also brings local economic growth to, uh, to an area. The 26-year-old refugee camp and the neighboring town of Kakuma boast a combined $56 million economy, with a total population equal to Kenya's 10th largest city. Benjamin Akala Kwam owns the Kakuma Payana bookstore. About 70% of our business is from the refugee camp, especially the NGOs around here. The camp's population more than doubled in the past five years, the refugees hail from 18 countries, with the new arrivals primarily from South Sudan. There has been some questions that have been posed, whether the refugees are uh, simply dependent on the humanitarian aid. The IFC report clearly showed that the economy is well beyond what the humanitarian agencies provide here. Somali refugee Hassan Mohamed Adan was luckier than most. He was able to borrow money from relatives to start a business. But restrictions prevent refugees from legally owning or renting property, moving freely and expanding or partnering with a Kenyan. So we need that documentation. We need also support, like, um, because you need money, okay? While Kenya's restrictions on refugees are unlikely to change, the UNHCR is moving from handouts of food and vouchers to cash allowances, something the IFC says should help attract private investors. Daniel Sheriff, BOA News, Kakuma, Kenya. This Friday, 8 p.m. English newscast has ended. Thank you so much for choosing STV. Have a colorful weekend. STV, votre télé.